Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. U.S. stocks bouncing back after a three-day plunge. Tech shares also rebounding with Tesla climbing back 11% after its worst day ever. Apple gaining 4%. Volatility remains the only certainty as markets continue to move with little predictability. This as the winds in California also shifted dramatically, bringing in ash from multiple fires burning across the northern part of the state, blanketing the Bay Area with a dark, thick orange haze. Rolling blackouts continuing to disrupt work and life as power providers work to prevent more fires from breaking out amidst extreme weather conditions. Joining us now to break down the day that was from hopefully clearer skies in New York City, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail, hope you do have clearer skies than we do today. Um, I do want to talk about this big tech rebound, the biggest uh, rebound after the worst stretch since March. What were you following? Well, Emily, you really nailed it, saying that the only certainty is volatility because it seems that that is what is going to continue. We had that worst stretch, as you mentioned, since March. That was the degree of the selling power. And then today we had the best day for the NASDAQ one going back to April 29th. So we had some buy the dip action. The big question is whether or not it will last. Will these investors continue buying the dip, knowing what they know about the options volatility going into uh, August's huge surge up and then down and all the other uncertainty. But you were mentioning Apple and Tesla, certainly a very good day for each, although it's so interesting, Emily. So Apple, you know, down 4% or excuse me, up 4% today after uh, dropping more than 10% over a few days. Nothing changed in that story. That tells you the degree of uh, hesitancy, uncertainty on the part of investors about what's next, just because the stock had gone so far so fast. Tesla, of course, something did change. Two things in terms of uh, GM's uh, partnership or investment um, in Nikola, and then also, of course, Tesla not being in the S&P 500. But it's interesting, Emily, that stock up 11%. You would think that's the best day in years. It's only the best day in about a week. That's because that stock, between the March lows and the recent high, up 600%. So really a little bit of down to earth, but volatility probably ahead. Today, the NASDAQ 100 uh, is down just a little bit. And if we take a look at a two-day chart of Apple and Tesla, you'll see both are still in the hole. So more work needs to be done. The dip buyers today need to continue you buying if we're going to see any uh, real stability ahead. Meantime, Abigail, we're continuing to wait for, for something, anything to happen with TikTok now less than a week away from the president's deadline for the company to sell its U.S. assets or face a ban in the United States. Obviously, larger implications here for U.S.-China relation, relations. How are those sort of broader sentiments and that sort of broader uncertainty weighing on investors? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think um, that's a very interesting question because if the situation stays very volatile, that could actually be an impetus uh, for the U.S. buyers, if they're really serious about buying the TikTok U.S. assets, to want to get done before it gets hugely volatile. On the other hand, in terms of ByteDance and the owner, there's lots of stories that he really doesn't need to sell. He has a cash cow anyway, and so that there might be some hesitancy. So I think from the selling standpoint, probably uh, less of an impact there. And then interestingly, today around 3.30, the market, while closing higher, closed off of the highs. And it may have had something to do with the Dow Jones uh, headline around TikTok and the idea uh, that the assets, that, the, that China is looking for a way to uh, have some sort of middle ground where all of the TikTok U.S. assets won't be sold. So on this, we saw the steepest decline for Walmart. And of course, Microsoft and Walmart uh, partnering here as a potential suitor. That stock at the highs up 3%, but into the close up just 1%. So really a slide on that. And the other suitors, including Microsoft, actually down on that. Uh, not down, excuse me, uh, off of its highs as well. But over the last month down, that's been the big tech stock of the suitors for TikTok hit the hardest. But Oracle and Twitter also on the day, um, you know, taking a little bit of a leg, low, leg lower, even though finishing higher. So, you know, from the standpoint of the overall picture, Emily, um, it's hard to see why the U.S. would want to compromise if the goal here is to protect security. Uh, a partial sale probably wouldn't do that. So I think that's why you saw a little bit of a leg lower. It talking about uncertainty, more uncertainty around the TikTok story.
All right. Well, we're going to continue to follow every tick and talk of it as uh, we get closer to that September 15th deadline. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much for that update. I want to stick with Tech's rebound today and bring in Scott Kessler of Third Bridge. Obviously, Scott, so many different things to consider here. We've, uh, you know, had a three-day sell-off, now a rebound. There, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason uh, to the way uh, investor sentiment seems to be swaying. What do you think is, is predictable at this time? Anything? Um. Can I say unpredictability? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so a couple of things come to mind, right? Um, so look, I think people didn't realize that tech stocks and the NASDAQ and the markets can actually decline. It seemed like we went straight up from uh, the March 23rd lows uh, through August, um, where we had the S&P 500 um, information technology sector up 75%. Um, over that period. Um, so that obviously is a pretty significant gain. Um, we're looking at a couple of different things, um, quarterly results and guidance. I think what's interesting is a couple of weeks ago when companies were um, providing results and guidance, we saw stocks shooting higher. Um, more recently, even with strong results, we saw some sell-offs and even today, we saw some companies, some cloud-oriented companies, um, report results and provide guidance that were perceived in a mixed fashion. So I'm thinking about um, Coupa software as well as Slack. And those stocks, even on a strong bounce back day like today, um, sold off. So maybe it indicates that people are being more discerning in terms of companies and operations and stock performance. Um, maybe it also indicates that people are paying attention to the U.S.-China tech war. They're paying attention to uncertainty related to the elections, the macroeconomic backdrop, where no one seems to know uh, what's going to happen next. Um, and of course, you know, we have an election coming up, as I mentioned. So there are a lot of things that people are focused on as we're getting close to closing the third quarter and starting the all-important fourth quarter. Slack shares ending the day down almost 14 percent on the back of their earnings report. They didn't, again, have a billings forecast. I spoke to the CEO, Stuart Butterfield, yesterday. He said uh, the future is still too uncertain, though growth still accelerating there in terms of paid customers. Scott, we've been watching Apple and Tesla in particular closely. Huge down days yesterday, um, rebounding today, though not fully recovering from the losses yesterday. What are some of the themes there that you're following? Yeah, I mean, I think for both of those companies, it seems like there's just been a lot of momentum in terms of both the operating performance and the stock performance. The sentiment has been very strong. It's perhaps not a coincidence that you have um, both of those companies having scheduled events over the course of a week, starting next week, right? Well, we have uh, Apple's Time Flies event where people aren't sure exactly what they're gonna announce. Um, probably some combination of new devices and hardware. Um, people are really looking forward to what they're saying about um, the iPhone in particular. iPhone accounted for, uh, I think, 44% uh, of the latest quarter's revenues. Um, AR is going to be a big theme there, augmented reality. Um, and then for Tesla, the week after that, uh, on September 22nd, they have a uh, battery day, uh, where I think a lot of people are looking forward to them talking about battery efficiency and how they're making progress there. So there's news flow to be coming from those two companies, which have been uh, bellwethers, I think, for uh, the market and uh, the tech surge over the last few months. So is there anything, any names out there that are reliable that you think will continue to see steady gains despite the uncertainty and unpredictability that is the only thing that's certain? Yeah, so what I would say, Emily, is I think there needs to be a disconnect between operating and stock performance. And I think what we've seen is a lot of companies, frankly, and perhaps surprisingly, if you go back to the sentiment uh, from kind of mid to late March, um, where it seems like a lot of companies are benefiting from this notion of digital transformation, moving to the cloud, working and learning from home. And so a lot of those companies and stocks, frankly, have been leaders. I think the real question now is people are wondering 
Number one, how sustainable um, that performance is from an operating perspective. And then number two, how much of the potential um, going out a few years was pulled forward, meaning how much momentum can these companies sustain over the next few quarters? And that remains to be seen, but I think it's fair to say that, as I just indicated, there are some companies that have a lot of momentum that kind of disappointed investors in some way um, yesterday, and those stocks sold off today, um, perhaps indicating that it's really not a monolith and it's not just straight up uh, for all these names. What are you going to be watching as we head into the election? Of course, there have been big tech names that have struggled with election issues. Facebook, for example, with misinformation. We just spoke to uh, the head of policy for TikTok saying they're working with the U.S. government to handle misinformation and foreign election meddling on their platform. Anything in particular that you have your eye on? You know, I think more generally, um, what I would say is people are really wondering about, number one, What's going to happen with the election, not just the presidential election, but uh, the U.S. Senate um, is in question in terms of whether it's going to swing um, to the Democratic Party or it's going to remain a uh, Republican held. That actually is pretty important as well. And so it seems like, by most accounts, the race has been tightening. And so people wonder whether or not we're going to see a contested election, whether we're going to see you know, results come out on election day or we're, if we're gonna have to wait days or weeks. And then what's gonna happen from that point? I think people are trying to assess exactly what the implications are there. And look, the markets and the economy, frankly, don't like uncertainty. And I think that's part of what's driving um, some of the volatility that we've been seeing. In terms of specific companies, I mean, it's interesting to see that Facebook indicated they're not gonna be taking or I guess producing any political advertising that final week. Um, I think other companies have made pronouncements around that. We'll see if any more actions are taken along those lines, but clearly they want to step out of the way of perhaps influencing the outcome of the election. And, and so I think that's something that, you know, we all should be mindful of. The other thing, as you were talking about just earlier uh, that I'm watching is uh, TikTok. What's going to happen there? And how what happens there is going to impact, I think, how people think about kind of the U.S.-China uh, tech cold war, if you will, that's been building. I think there's been some news flow more recently um, on semiconductors um, and semiconductor manufacturing, Inc., um, that's out of China, and kind of the supply chain that was so important at the beginning of the coronavirus lockdowns. Um, that, I think, is going to become an increasing issue. Uh, as we get closer uh, to the election. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended the education system, not just here in the United States, but around the world. In our continuation of our education technology series, we spoke with Jeff Richards, GGV Capital Managing Partner, who invests in education technology around the globe. I asked about the growth he's seen in these companies, how remote learning is going so far on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. But I, you know, what I tell people is it's sort of like if you were a, if you were a lab technician or a scientist and you were running a 10 year experiment to try and get to some end game and it all happened in 12 months, that's basically what we're seeing in a bunch of these categories, e-commerce, I mentioned telemedicine earlier. Telemedicine is just boomed, obviously, as people couldn't visit doctors physically, they're switching to, to virtual primary care. You're seeing that with Teladoc, Plush Care, Omada, you know, Livongo, all these companies that have suddenly become uh, uh, darlings of investors. So I'd say you know, looking, doubling down on e-commerce, doubling down on telemedicine, doubling down on ed tech, and then just software broadly. You're seeing a massive increase in adoption by Fortune 500 CEOs of technology, literally increasing their spend by 10 or 20% and accelerating adoption by hundreds of billions of dollars over the next few years.
Now, often when we talk to venture capitalists, they say they're not necessarily paying attention to what's going on in the public markets, but I feel like you can't ignore the environment that we're in right now, not just a pandemic, but you know, over the last three days, we've seen a massive sell-off that could be turning around today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. How much is what's happening on the, the public side actually impacting the decisions that you're making? Yeah, I think it's it, it's actually more correlated than, than people would uh, often lead on just because what you're seeing is the same value accrue in the public markets to those companies that are in the right categories. If you if you look at companies in the categories that I mentioned earlier, you're seeing massive appreciation and then trends like electric vehicles and clean energy are, are suddenly catching fire. Obviously, Tesla, you know, been one of the hottest stocks of the last few years. But you also look at software for security, software for remote learning, obviously Zoom and Slack. Those categories you're seeing doubling and tripling, tripling of the company's valuations because the, the markets are accelerating by three to five years. So if you apply that to our world where we're investing in private companies, we're seeing that same acceleration. We are seeing companies, you know, I've got several companies I'm on the board of that are at 120, 150, even 300% of their plans for this year. And so you're seeing that same energy towards uh, valuing those companies and putting more capital work in those companies happen in the private space. And then of course, huge amount of demand for IPOs, right? Investors are thirsty for new names coming to market. Software IPOs in particular have done extremely well for the last four years. So you're seeing huge demand for Snowflake, you know, Airbnb, these other names that are coming out. Now, EdTech hasn't necessarily had its moment. There isn't a single EdTech or EdTech focused company that's worth tens of billions of dollars like you have Google or Apple or Facebook, though all of those big companies do sort of dabble in education and have education verticals. Do you think that could change um, because of, of the, the, the transformation that's happening in the education system right now? And why hasn't that happened yet? It's a great question. I think the reason it hasn't happened in the U.S. is people initially took the approach of trying to sell technology into the existing education system. And our existing education system is largely government run. Government has not traditionally been an aggressive adopter of early technology. And so, you know, in an ideal world, our school systems would have been prepared for this digital transformation. They weren't. Most of them got a cold start in Q2 with the pandemic. So I think you'll see a shift and you'll see more adoption of technologies like Zoom and remote learning and some of these uh, applications that we talked about, but outside the U.S., and let's remember there's only 330 million people in the U.S. There's 7 billion outside the U.S. Outside the U.S., this trend has been happening for, for some time. And so we have, you know, we have uh, portfolio companies that have tens of millions of users on these digital learning platforms. They're way ahead of companies in the U.S. And I do think you'll see companies worth five, 10, 15 billion dollars. It'll probably happen outside the U.S. first, because let's remember if you go back, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, 20 years ago, there were only 100 million people on the internet, right? Now you've got several billion, which is creating access not only to education, but finance, banking, all these things that we've known for the U.S. in the U.S. as a, as a modern economy for a long period of time. How different the world could be in the next 20 years thanks to technology, we shall see. Jeff Richards, GGV Capital Managing Partner there. And we continue our virtual classroom series focusing on education technology all this week. We're going to hear from a leading researcher in this space later in the show and how remote learning could have lasting negative impacts. Coming up, the royal battle between Apple and Epic Games continues to escalate with Apple striking a major counter blow. The latest on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Apple has fired back in its legal battle with Fortnite creator Epic Games, filing a countersuit and seeking compensation for lost fees. The iPhone maker is asking the court to stop Epic from using its own payment system for Fortnite, which Apple calls unlawful, saying what Epic is attempting to do amounts to theft. For more, I'm to bring in Bloomberg's Malathy Nayak, who has been following this case for us. So, uh, Malathy... Epic also saying that after September 11th, Fortnite users won't be able to log in uh, via Apple uh, uh, Apple entrances. Talk to us a little bit about Apple's counter suit here. This is a pretty uh, significant next move. 
Thanks so much for having me, Emily. Yeah, this is quite a bold move by Apple. They're striking back now with their own countersuit. And uh, Apple is actually asking a California federal court to block Epic's direct payments mechanism that it says circumvents its own app store. And Apple also wants the court to rule that Epic violated contractual ob obligations under its app store licensing agreement by setting up its own Fortnite marketplace. So what's happening here is, um, you know, some users who had uh, the older version of the app can continue using um, suppose the supposed hot fix that Apple put in place to set up its marketplace. So Apple is now striking back to try and prevent uh, any user from, um, you know, uh, having to go through Apple's direct, uh, sorry, Epic's direct payment uh, system. Now, it's interesting to see Apple seeking damages. Apple, which obviously has got piles and piles of cash, is one of the richest companies in the world, um, claimed that Epic is also a multi-billion dollar company and Apple should be compensated for these losses. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think it's quite an interesting move uh, by Apple, you know, given that Epic in this case isn't seeking damages in its suit that it filed. Um, so according to Epic, um, it's only looking to fight back against Apple's app market dominance that it says prevents developers from charging customers directly. Um, so, yeah, Apple, though, you know, in, in its counter suit says that it suffered irreparable harm because Epic has usurped its commission and it's broken its app store rules. It wants damages to compensate for loss of fees and broken customer relationships. Uh, Apple actually has even gone a step further and is asking for punitive damages, which is an elevated fine, um, um, to punish Epic for its alleged fraudulent misconduct of setting up its own marketplace. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting move. Um, uh, Apple, I think, is just sort of trying to strike back uh, with as much force as possible. What's the next legal move you're watching for? So actually, uh, by the end of the month, on September 28th, the judge overseeing the case has set a hearing uh, in which uh, the judge will decide whether Epic should be granted an injunction that would get Apple to reinstate Fortnite back on the App Store. So I think there'll be um, a lot of interesting questions there, especially in some of the antitrust issues that Epic has brought up in its suit. You know, there'll be a lot of uh, discussion uh, potentially on questions around who decides how much of a cut uh, app stores should take from developers, you know, where is the standard 30 percent cut fair, and whether Epic's argument that Apple's app store is a monopoly holds true. So that's what we're waiting to see next, uh, you know, okay. to see whether Epic can uh, fight back. Well, we'll be watching for the next move in the Battle Royale. Bloomberg's Malathi Nayak, thank you so much for that update. All right, coming up, the famously secretive company Palantir holding its investor day today, giving us a peek beneath the curtain. We'll get some insight from an investor who was in that meeting about how the company is gearing up to go public. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Palantir, the famously secretive and controversial data mining company backed by Peter Thiel, is poised to go public via a direct listing on the New York Stock Exchange on or about September 23rd. Joining us now for more, Santosh Rao, head of research at Manhattan Venture Partners, who was at Palantir's virtual investor day meeting today. So, Santosh, thank you so much for joining us. How did that meeting go? Did you get more of the concrete details that you were looking for about the business? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, as you know, we are early investors in Palantir, so we knew a lot about it. And I've been writing about this for the last four or five years that I've covered this company for my, uh, for my company. Uh, it was a great uh, uh, analyst day, a lot of information, a lot of granularity and clarity in on their products. And that was a big strike against them for so long. It's a very opaque company. No one knew exactly. We had vague idea what they do. I mean, the general public did not know, rather. Uh, so I think this was good. They came out, gave us good use cases, gave us some clarity on where they want to go, their long-term targets. Uh, and, and overall, their, their positioning in this market, in fast-moving market, against their competitors. I think it was very informative, and I came out uh, very, uh, very convinced that our bull case is justified.
So how big is the bull case, though? This is a company that raised at a $20 billion valuation in a private round a few years ago, but you have new, um, you know, research companies pegging the valuation closer to $9 billion. Do you think that the company is going to see a big down round as a result of this listing? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, uh, this company has not been an easy ride. It has its ups and downs. Uh, investors have had to wait a long time for their exit. Uh, it had its share of issues with the products. I think really in the last two, three years, it's really come the growth. The revenue engine has really fired up with their foundry product, uh, which is uh, closest to a plug and play. It's a faster rollout and the revenue recognition is faster. So all that is really coming together. So over a period of time, it has it, it was pretty slow. So when it raised the money last time, the market was in a different place. Uh, then it went down because there were a lot of uh, concerns, rumors, this, that, you know, a lot of negative PR. So this company has been, has seen everything. Uh, so um, I think at this point, uh, they've had it all together. Uh, I would say uh, the valuation that you mentioned is probably on the low end. Uh, I can see a little further out, maybe around 16 to 17 billion coming off the gate, uh, considering all the peers around them and their own growth trajectory down the road that we project. So I think that's closer to that. Uh, 20 billion looks slightly higher at this point, and I would rather they go a little lower and prove themselves and work their way into it. Um, you know, speaking about uh, the culture and some of the controversial relationship with the U.S. government, obviously the U.S. government is a huge customer of Palantir. In fact, the revenue is about half and half split between government entities and private commercial companies. Um, CEO Alex Karp at the Investor Day was pretty clear. He said, we've picked sides here. If you don't like uh, who we're working with, then don't invest in our company. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think that's been uh, their trademark, you know, they've been pretty independent. Uh, they don't care about the PR that generally works in Silicon Valley and on Wall Street. Uh, they're pretty focused on what they do. Uh, and they are, one of the things about this company is they're not afraid to take on risky projects, projects that are not popular, but that are that fall into their mission of being patriotic and doing the right thing by the army, by the government, by our allies. So they're not afraid to do that. And that's been their forte. Uh, that's been their strength, but also it's, it's you know, it has a lot of headwinds in terms of PR. Uh, so this company really sits at the intersection of uh, Me Too, Trump, uh, all, all the different issues playing out there, ICE and this and that. But uh, underneath the covers, this is a strong software company with two solid products catering to a market that needs it at this point. How concerned are you about the governance issues and the fact that the co-founders, including Peter Thiel, are going to own almost half the shares of the company and, and voting control in perpetuity? Yeah, it's always a concern, and we would rather, if they do want, if they want to have that, I would rather they have a sunset clause. Uh, I can see them having control in the earlier years, in the beginning, to shape the company in their vision. So that makes sense. But then you have to have a sunset clause to come out and then just let it float and uh, uh, let the market and uh, the board decide what, uh, what to do next. So I think that is definitely a concern, was a concern is a concern with many other companies also that we have invested in, like Lyft and all that. But dual structures have become the norm for the startups. Hopefully, it will get better and you'll have a sunset clause for everyone, <laughs> a requirement. So uh, it doesn't really make it uh, bad. You know? So I think let's see where it goes. But it's definitely not the ideal situation. So what are you going to be watching for as we approach September 23rd, the day-ish that we're expecting this to happen quickly? Yeah, so it's not really an IPO, right? So it's a direct listing. So you really don't have a price that they need to beat or anything like that. So, so that's good. 
in that sense. So uh, we'll, we'll see uh, where they come out, uh, if it holds, which, which I think it will. Uh, there'll be a little commentary around it. The biggest thing that investors will be looking for, can they sustain the first half growth, which was solid? The year-over-year -year growth is solid. So they just want that continuation into uh, the first half. The third quarter numbers are going to be important, and hopefully they will continue from there. Just the beat and raise quarters down the road, which is very important for these startups. All right, Santosh Rao of Manhattan Venture Partners. We're going to be charting this every day towards the direct listing, as you say. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up, we're going to talk to an expert in the virtual classroom world, looking at some of the possible negative impacts of remote learning. That's next on our virtual classroom series, airing all week on Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Wildland fires and rolling blackouts continue to ravage much of Northern California. You're taking a live look there at the view from our camera on the roof of our building in San Francisco. Most of us woke up to dark orange and smoky filled skies this morning. That's a look of the Bay Bridge where fires turned daylight to dusk. Many concerned about air quality as these fires continue to ravage California, Oregon, and Washington, all in the midst of a sustained lockdown due to the pandemic, the start of school in the United States, for most of us happening remotely. It seems as though every time educators get used to one scenario, a new problem emerges. Continuing with our virtual classroom series this week, I spoke with Emma Dorn, an education practice manager at McKinsey, and got her response to how students, teachers, and educators can stay nimble when we don't know what the future holds. It's a tough situation for sure. Um, you know, I think there are some things that we can do that are super tactical uh, and super immediate. Uh, the first is we need to ensure every student has access. Uh, right now, um, Common Sense Media just, just put out a report which estimates that uh, 15 to 16 million students actually lack access to adequate internet and, and devices. And, and the cost to fix that is not enormous. It's uh, six to $11 billion across the whole of the United States. Uh, and those are reflected in some of those login numbers that we shared as well. You know, 90% of high income students are, are logging into to remote learning where only 60% of low income students are. And, and that's a problem that, that we can fix. Now, education is based on, the education system is based on a centuries old model. Do you see what's happening now potentially changing the education system as we know it, that, the, that perhaps innovation or something good will come out of this crisis? Uh, so, I mean, there is the old adage, never waste a good crisis. That said, I think we also have to be really careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. There's mm. a lot of research around what works in education. And we don't want to throw that out. So what works in, in early literacy and numeracy programs? What works in terms of the criticality of getting good teachers uh, and supporting those teachers to teach well? Uh, and, and the importance of really good formative assessment to understand what students are learning. That said, I do think, you know, the technology has advanced and we need to be thinking about new ways of using that uh, as we go forwards. And I can give a few examples if you're interested. Like what? So, so for example, technology does some things really well, you know, adaptive learning software, for example, can really help students to uh, adopt a mastery based approach where they really master one topic, especially in mathematics before moving on, on to the next. But then technology also really doesn't do some things well, you know, on the relationship side, um, for example, and we actually did some analysis of the 2018 uh, PISA assessment results. Um, at, across 50 different countries. And what we found is that students who use a lap, uh, sorry, use a tablet in their classrooms actually perform half a grade below those students who don't in math, reading, and science. And so as we go forwards, it's really important to integrate the best of what we know about what works with tech, but not to uncritically just uh, adopt a whole bunch of devices into the classroom. Meantime, you've got some education systems out there looking to make some pretty dramatic changes, like some schools in Cleveland considering throwing out grade levels altogether. I mean, is that something good that should stay or something uh, not so good that should go? So, I mean, I think we're in the midst of a vast experiment right now, right? We have never had a shift to remote learning uh, 
uh, across the whole nation. And, and I think that those experiments are gonna be important. Uh, and I think what we really need is data to understand which of these are working well and which of these are not working well. And uh, scrapping grade levels is one example, moving to a mastery-based learning approach more broadly is another example. Um, uh, but I think what's really important is that as we do these experiments, we're, we're gathering the data we need to assess them and work out whether they're really delivering for our children. You also talk about the importance of relationships. How do teachers foster relationships with students and parents with teachers and parents with their own children at this time? And that is really critical. One of the things we've heard, especially from teachers, is that students are coming back into the classroom to some extent traumatized, right, by all of the, the trends that you've just been talking about. And as we think about how do we improve remote learning, that focus on relationships is critical. I can give a couple of examples of things that we've heard some teachers are doing. One is pulse checks at the beginning of every single day, pulse checks, how are the students doing? Another is really checking in one-on-one -on -one with every single family and every single student. And an example of what some school districts are doing here is, is an assessment. So it's obviously critically important to work out at the beginning of the year, how much learning have these kids lost? But the last thing you wanna do is bring kids back in and sit them down for a four hour test, right? When they're already in an emotional state that, that's slightly traumatized. And so what some districts are doing is instead of that, they're actually scheduling time one-on-one -on -one with each student between the teacher and the student to do reading assessments. And that way you kill two birds with one stone, you both start to rebuild that, that student teacher relationship, but you also understand exactly where that student is so that you can design curriculum to really help them catch up whatever they've missed. You mentioned that the learning gap can have an impact on earning potential. What about on GDP? What about our economy as a whole? Absolutely. So, so in that same report, we, we looked at the potential GDP loss and, and we estimated that the GDP loss would be about 170 to $270 billion per year uh, once we hit steady state in 2040. And, and that's about a 1% loss uh, of GDP. And we can avoid that loss by putting in really strong programs now to help kids catch up lost learning, making sure that they're still exposed to grade level learning, but that that's matched with high intensity tutoring to help them fill in those gaps that, that, that they lost in the spring and maybe some are losing in the fall. A jam packed segment full of information there, Emma Dorn of McKinsey and Company. We have some breaking news now to tell you about JP Morgan has indeed found that some of its employees improperly applied for and received relief funds intended for small businesses hurt by the pandemic. The bank uh, sent a vague email yesterday. We've been continuing to follow the stories, and indeed, they've learned that some of these employees had money improperly deposited into their accounts. Uh, all of these funds tied to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which, which is separate from the Paycheck Protection Program, um, but something that J.P. Morgan is now uh, continuing to investigate and will be following uh, what action they take there. We'll have more of Bloomberg Technology after this quick break. From Wall Street to Capitol Hill, big tech continues to make headlines. Three Republican lawmakers have introduced new legislation that would prevent big tech companies from taking down conservative speech on their platform. Marsha Blackburn, co-chair of the Senate Judiciary Tech Task Force, talked about the bill and its chances of her passage with our own Kevin Cirilli. Revisiting and dealing with Section 230 has been a priority. So we know that you're not going to have alternatives to these platforms until you deal with 230. We know there's not going to be accountability for bias until you reform Section 230. So what we've done is to come to agreement on how you can reshape this and reform it so that you preserve that competitive marketplace so that you don't overreach, but you have that accountability that is necessary. Now, one of the things that we're doing is removing that otherwise objectionable language. That is what people would say, well, they're subjective because they can hide behind this as a shield. Also, what we have done is to specify that that shield applies 
to platforms that have restricted certain content. So there's a little bit of clarity brought there. Now, we have um, the content moderation. You've got a reasonableness standard that comes into play there. Objectively reasonable uh, standard that we would put in place and then defining an information content um, developer and provider so that you know who that standard is going to be applying to. Your content creators, individuals, companies, people that are editorializing. I mean, it, this is and, really long overdue for an overhaul. It's been, that's it, right. 1920 wasn't designed that's for the right. internet. That's right, in the censorship, uh, and then also looking at uh, how you got into those third-party comments, the things that were done there. So it's important to go in and bring this clarity to bear. Well, it, it faces an uphill battle with Democrats, but just how significant is it to have the three co-sponsors of this legislation all coming together in the Republican Senate to say this is where the party is on this particular issue? Well, not only is it the party, but and not only is it going to be here in the Senate, this is going to be filed in the House. And also, we think that we can get bipartisan support for this. Everyone agrees that big tech is overreaching. Everyone agrees that big tech brings their bias to bear. That is why you want to have this standard and put it in place, and why you want to be able to say, look, uh, we're going to take out the nebulous language and we're going to bring some specificity to it. If it is promoting self-harm, it is promoting terrorism, uh, then putting those definitions in place, getting that on paper, that's important to do. President Trump tweeted about this just the other day. Yes. And he tweeted directly at Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and said that, you know, he... I'm paraphrasing, but get rid of Section 230. Well, and, and you I know don't you want talk to get rid of it. Not get rid what of it. What you want to do is to go in and modify it so that it meets today's marketplace. When these companies were in their infancy, they needed those protections. Now they are using that liability shield, kind of hiding behind the skirts, if you will. And what they are doing is saying, oh, you can't come get us. Well, we have decided that we think this is uh, objectionable. So therefore, you put in the specificity. Therefore, you take away that nebulous language. And you begin to say, no, this is going to be a content creator. This is going to be content moderation. This is going to be who has liability protection. Marsha Blackburn there, co-chair of the Senate Judiciary Tech Task Force with Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli. All right, well, one tech company not stirring up debate on Capitol Hill so far is Netflix. Even as traditional media companies like AT&T and Comcast entered the crowded video streaming market, Netflix says it's focused solely on entertainment, not news, not sports. In a conversation with David Rubenstein, Netflix co-founder and co-CEO Hastings explained why. Take a listen. Said, no, we need to have original programming. Well, Ted was intimately familiar with the history of cable television. And right from the beginning, he educated us on HBO's path which their first 20 years in the 80s and 90s, they just had recycled programming. And then with shows like Sopranos and The Wire, uh, they moved into original programming and what a difference it made for them. So we were very aware of that history and then it was just a matter of biding time till we got big enough. So today, the original programming that you have, is that more popular than the non-original that you're in effect renting from somebody else? Yeah, that's right. The original programming, um, driving uh, The Old Guard, our, our newest movie, uh, Kissing Booth 2, an amazing movie, um, our series like India Matchmaking or Umbrella Academy uh, are all driving both the viewing and the membership growth. So we're fundamentally an original content business that supplements with licensed content around the world. Why is it that on Netflix, you, your, your, your content is very popular, but you don't do uh, things like news or sports? How come you haven't done those yet? 
Well, those are great areas, but they're well covered by other companies. And we have so much more we want to do on series uh, and films. And we're, you know, breaking into animated films and series now. <clears throat> We've done really well with unscripted reality programming, uh, like India Matchmaking that I mentioned, and Love is Blind, and Tiger King. So our, our hands are just full. And again, there's other companies doing other things. And, you know, we just want to focus on entertainment. Netflix co-founder and co-CEO Reed Hastings there on the latest episode of The David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations. Catch the full interview, 9 p.m. Eastern tonight on Bloomberg Television. And lastly, Nintendo is boosting its production of the Switch console yet again to as much as 30 million units for the fiscal year. The Japanese game maker has been struggling to keep up with demand for the Switch for most of 2020, having already raised orders to 25 million units in early August. Console production stifled by COVID-19 lockdowns in China early this year, but now back to being fully operational and the surging demand largely due to the success of the Animal Crossing game, New Horizons, and of course more people being shut in and playing games. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are live streaming on Twitter. As always, you can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network quick take on Twitter as well. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Stay tuned for Bloomberg Daybreak Australia next. This is Bloomberg. Mm -hmm.